Okay, so let's have a look at our scientific method. The first thing that we have to do is we have to ask a question. And for Cavendish, what he wanted to know was what is the density of the Earth? And his proposed answer is that the density of the Earth could be compared to something with a known density. If he checked the gravitational attraction of two known masses and compared them to each other, he could get an idea of what the density of Earth would be relative to the density of water. So what he decided to do was he tried to come up with two masses of a known distance apart, and he wanted to measure the force of attraction between the two of them. So how did he propose to do this? Well, say we have a magnet, and a magnet's got a north and a south. And if we put it next to another magnet that has a south and a north, you're going to get an attraction between the two. Now, if we duct tape this one to the table, like so, and we put a little WD-40 under this one, this magnet won't move but this magnet will be drawn towards the other magnet. One thing that we can do is we can put a spring on one end of this magnet. As it's drawn to the other magnet, this spring will stretch. And eventually, when it stops moving, the tension on that spring will equal the force of attraction between the two of them. Now, you can't really do this with masses because just two pieces of lead will not attract themselves enough to stretch a spring. But is there another way that we can do it? Let's take a wire and hang it to a beam. Now, we're going to balance this beam with two weights on each end of known mass. And as long as this beam is balanced and these weights are an equal distance above the table, gravity will be equal on both of these. This will be a balance point right here. And this weight will not move because all of the forces on it are clearly in balance. If we put a larger weight next to it on both sides, there will be a gravitational attraction between these two, and we can measure the distance from center to center on both of them. And as a result, this balance beam will try and move as this little ball is attracted to the larger ball. And if we know the amount of twist in this wire, we can figure out that the wire is trying to force it that way, whereas the weight is trying to force it that way. Now, just as when we were dealing with the two magnets, one of which was fixed to the desk and the other one was attached to a spring, when the magnet stopped moving, the force exerted by the spring equaled the force of attraction of the other magnet. The same thing could be said for Cavendish. Now, left to its own designs, the one small ball would continue in its attraction all the way to the point it touched the other ball. However, by attaching the wire and making that wire twist as the small ball moved towards the large ball, the twist in the wire would try to bring them back apart to the neutral position. When the ball stopped moving, it meant that it reached a balance point between the force of the wire twisting it away and the force of gravity pulling it towards the other ball. So here we have the force of gravity pulling this small ball towards the larger one, and it's opposed by the twist of the wire trying to pull it away. And force one and force two are equal to each other when the ball is stationary. So what Cavendish did was he built this apparatus where he had a ball, he had two small balls that were attached by a beam. And in the middle, it was up to the ceiling by a wire. And then what he did was he took two large balls 
and put them at 90 degrees to this beam. So, the weight of the balls, or the gravitational attraction of the Earth, was equal on both sides. So that was no longer a factor. The attraction of the small balls to the big balls was also balanced. And what he did was he adjusted this until it was a perfect right angle between these two balls, and all the forces were in balance. Then what he did was he rotated these large balls, so now he's got the large balls right up next to the small balls, and there's a gravitational attraction between the large balls and the small ball. And that's trying to make the beam rotate in that direction. However, the wire is twisting, and it's trying to force it back in that direction. And once this system settles down from the starting point, the force of the twist will equal the force of the attraction. Now when Cavendish did this experiment, he was very careful to eliminate all possible sources of air. He examined magnetism. He looked at vibrations. And he looked at air currents. Now let's see an actual Cavendish experiment done in modern days. BM Furball Pancake Hero is a friend of mine that was living in South Korea at the time, and he had an extra bedroom in his apartment. So he set up a Cavendish experiment. He used dumbbells as his weights, uh, both 20-pound dumbbells and 40-pound dumbbells, and some smaller ones for the small weights. He suspended his bar from the ceiling using piano wire as a torsion balance. He had the entire apparatus enclosed in a box to minimize temperature changes and wind currents, and he operated the entire device via video camera and remote motor. The way that he measured the amount of deflection was using a mirror and a laser against a scale. So let's go ahead and see what he did. Now that's an experiment that we can all do at home. All we need is a spare room, a little plexiglass, a little motor, and a video camera, and just the time and willingness to do the proper measurements. Now let's take a moment and let Blue Marble Science go through all the mathematics of this to show exactly what it was that Cavendish found and how he did it. The mean diameter of the Earth is 41,800,000 feet. That is 3,958.3 miles in radius. By a mean of the experiments made with the wire first used, the density of the Earth comes out 5.48 times greater than that of water. And by a mean of those made with the latter wire, it comes out the same. So, Cavendish measured a specific gravity for the Earth of 5.48. What could we do with those two numbers? The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. For a sphere with a diameter of 41,800,000 feet, the volume is 3.824 times 10 to the 22nd cubic feet. The density of water is 62.3 pounds per cubic foot. 
The density of the earth, therefore, is 62.3 pounds per cubic foot times 5.48, and that yields 341.04 pounds per cubic foot. Notice the little M behind the LB. That stands for pounds mass. We use pounds as both mass and force. If it had been a force, I would have written LBF. All right, back to this. Mass of the Earth is therefore 341.04 pounds per cubic foot times 3.824 times 10 to the 22nd cubic feet or a mass of 1.303 times 10 to the 25th pounds. That's pounds mass. We can convert that to kilograms by dividing by 2.205, and you end up with 5.9098 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. That's within 1% of the number we use today. But we could find out something else too if we had wanted to, and so could Cavendish. If you look over here on the left side, this is the way Newton originally wrote the equation. F is proportional to m1, m2 divided by r squared. Proportional to means there is a constant of proportionality that you can add if you wish. And you can make that equation say equals. And we can do that by adding the constant of proportionality, which for us is what we call big G. That's what we got from Newton ultimately. We got something else from Newton. He also gave us force is equal to mass times acceleration. Now imagine, if you will, I set those two equations equal to each other. I'll end up with acceleration equals g times m2 divided by r squared, m2 being the large mass, m2 being the earth. Now acceleration, a, is equal to what we call little g and it is a measurable quantity of 9.81 meters per second squared. That hasn't changed since 1798. We can solve the equation in the upper right corner for big G and find that that is equal to little g r squared divided by m2. We now have everything we need, and Cavendish would have had everything he needed. He just didn't state it this way. When we run through the numbers, we get a value for G, which Cavendish could easily have stated as well, he just didn't, of 6.7456 times 10 to the minus 11th. That, again, is about 1% off from the accepted value today. Well, I hope you enjoyed our little talk today and scientific method in action with the Henry Cavendish experiment, which determined the gravitational constant and the mass of the Earth. Now, people like to bring up the fact that Cavendish did not actually determine G, and that's true, but he got all of the data together that we needed to determine G in the decades after his experiment. The other thing is that he didn't actually measure the mass itself of the Earth. What he measured was the density of the Earth compared to water. However, we know the volume of the Earth, we know the density of the Earth. It's a simple calculation to determine the mass from that. So in reality, he did answer both those questions, both big G and the mass of the Earth. Let's go through our scientific method for this experiment. Step one is we ask a question, what is the density of the Earth? Step two is our proposed answer, and that is that we could measure the gravitational attraction of objects of known density, compare that density to the density of water, and come up with basically a specific gravity or a comparative density of the Earth. We made a prediction that we could measure the gravitational attraction between two objects of known mass and known distance. And then we tested that theory with a Cavendish apparatus. We then reviewed our data and made our conclusions. So the two criticisms that I've heard of the Cavendish experiment is that it didn't actually measure G. As we've seen from Blue Marble Science, that's easily derived from the data that Cavendish provided. The other is that it never measured the mass of the Earth, and that indeed is true. He was looking specifically at the density of the Earth. But since he knew the exact volume of the Earth, if you have the density, the mass is a simple calculation away. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan and my kitchen table. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you'll hit that like and subscribe button down there and maybe consider joining the channel as a member. 
In the meantime, y'all take care and we'll see you again soon.